This is CBC Here and Now. Hacking basketball contributed significantly to reducing the subsidy to this facility. So the third party management by, uh, by, the, by the group wouldn't have reduced the taxpayers' subsidy to mile one. A dispute over mile one. Weeks after winning the Kelly Cup, the owners of the Newfoundland Growlers and the St. John's Edge can't reach a deal with the city of St. John's. I'm honoured and I'm humbled with my appointment as the 20th Chief of Police of the Royal Newfoundland Conservatory. The, the exact diagnosis is that I have a glioblastoma, which is stage four cancer, um, and it's inoperable. Remembering Bob Johnston, the former chief of the RNC passed away today just a year after telling us about his fight with an aggressive brain cancer. Tonight, we look back at his long career with the RNC. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We start tonight with a closer look at the costs of running communities in the Metro St. John's area. Town managers keep towns ticking. They make the plans that councils dream up happen. But in the metro region, the combined salaries add up. Now they certainly do. And those are salaries that are paid by your town and city taxes. So might combining services between municipalities be a cheaper alternative? Well, that's not exactly a topic that's popular for any level of government to tackle, so we are going to tackle that ourselves. Here now as Katie Breen takes this look now at what is an uncomfortable truth. John's metro area stretches from Pooch Cove and Balleen through to Whitless Bay. 13 communities total, and each one has a main manager. On this tip of the island, Town manager salaries total about $1.4 million, but is there a better way? Take Toronto. 13 times the people in 80% of the space, and there's one city manager making between three hundred and forty and 380000 That's a million dollars less than the total paid out here. And Halifax. The regional municipality is nearly twice the size of Metro St. John's. About seven times more people live there, and it pays its main city manager about $284,000. Look at the salaries here. The city of St. John's much smaller, a lot fewer people, but the salary is comparable, $234,000. Closest to that is Mount Pearl. The manager there gets about 208000 and Mount Pearl is nearly 30 times smaller than St. John's, with about a quarter of the population. CBS pays close to 200000 Paradise is about $140,000. Torbay, the manager there, makes 120000 when less than 8,000 people live there. The salaries generally get smaller the fewer people the town has, but still, it all adds up. I think for one thing, it's the complexity of the organization. Um, certainly the, the city of St. John's is, is a much more complex organization than, than the town of Balleen or the town of Bay Roberts. Uh, so so the, there's got to be a, a difference in, um, in response. There's, there's some key responsibilities that we all have as, as administrators, but certainly um, the, size of the size of the organization is going to make a difference in some of the expertise that's needed to, to run those organizations. Black manages Bay Roberts. He's also head of the Professional Municipal Administrators, an organization of town managers and other town workers in the province. He says, sure, there's probably room for efficiencies, have towns share more, maybe consolidate some duties, regionalize some things. But he doesn't think amalgamation full stop is the best idea. And neither does Rob Greenwood with Munns Harris Center. Amalgamation I don't see as the answer. I see regional governance with really what we need is a, an authority between the level of individual small municipalities we have now and the province. Greenwood says really town manager salaries are small dollars compared to the cost of actually providing services like water and sewer. He says sharing and collaborating, that's what's actually going to save money. And according to him, this region here, Metro, is already doing a pretty good job of that. He says it's outside the Northeast Avalon that needs work. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, on the ice, it was a season of success for the Newfoundland Growlers, but away from the game, the team's owner was facing off with the city in negotiations for Mile One Center in St. John's. And that all came to a head today as the city announced that it won't be handing over the keys to either of the city's two pro sports franchises. The city ended an agreement to explore the option of having the teams take the stadium off its hands. Here now is Ryan Cook joins us live now. So Ryan, what's the reaction from the owners in this? 
Well, Dean McDonald, the owner of the Newfoundland Growlers, says he's flabbergasted. The owners put in a proposal recently, but that was shot down today. But really, McDonald says it's generous to call it a proposal since they couldn't get all the information they needed to put in a proper one. I don't know what they expect. And then, then for the city to say, we made a proposal. We didn't make a proposal. We said, look, if you're not going to give us the information, this is best we can say. That's, they weren't serious, let's be honest. Not even close to serious. The city says it turned over all the information needed for due diligence, but McDonald says he couldn't get information on things like beer and food sales from the games this season. As a result, he says their proposal included that controversial taxpayer handout, and that didn't sit well with the mayor. So we would still have that level of subsidy. So it did not include a reduction in the subsidy. So the third party management by, uh, by, the, by the group wouldn't have reduced the taxpayers' subsidy to mile one. Taking over the arena could be hugely beneficial to both clubs and to the taxpayers. At the start of the year, the subsidy was said to be around $2 million. McDonald believes revenue from the Growlers and the Edge knocked around $800,000 off that number. You would think they'd say, look, the only two things we got going for us right now in this facility is the two sports teams because we actually make money from them. And so, uh, but they're doing an awful good job of trying to drive us away. But look, we're committed. We'll be here. Now, the uh, le leasing the rink hasn't really worked out well for either franchise. Even with the Kelly Cup win this past season, the Growlers still didn't turn a profit. And McDonald says it was the same story for the Edge the first two seasons they've been here. So that's why they want to take this building over and the convention center so that they can hold other events like concerts, conventions to bring that revenue up. But for the meantime, they'll be left to negotiate another lease with the city. And McDonald is threatening legal action to get the numbers that he wants. Reporting live for Here Now in St. John's, I'm Ryan Cook. Cleaning up, uh, drying things out, and uh, estimating how much damage there actually was. A wet wake up for Easter seals in St. John's. Flooding at their headquarters means moving programs, and that includes a busy summer camp, and the cleanup could take months. We'll get an update on what they plan to do next, coming up. <laughs> Well, three nice days in a row for the Avalon today. Actually, the warmest day reaching uh, a high near what's showing 24, but actually 25 degrees uh, was the high in St. John's. That's the warmest since uh, last August, actually. And we've got a number of areas in those 20 degree range, 18 for Cornerbrook, but still that cool pool of air sitting over Labrador right now. We can see that low pressure system spinning counter uh, spinning as we head through the day today and that brought some thunderstorms. So if we take a look at that satellite and radar, you can see all that lightning activity. Now there is a potential that we will see some lightning as we head through the next couple of hours, but tomorrow uh, looks a little rainy. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. One year ago today, some St. John's residents were rushing to escape as strong winds pushed a towering forest fire into their backyards. Difficult memories of that day are still fresh in the minds of the people who were there. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. This is what it looked like a year ago today. It was a hot summer day, but the sun was obscured by thick smoke in Kenmount Terrace. It was very scary. <laughs> Drone video taken that day shows the extent of the fire. Acres of trees gone. As the flames spread, Allison Rose's phone buzzed. It was a text saying her neighborhood was being evacuated. So um, I drove home from work um, to come out tears being filled with smoke and people running around crazy, I'm sorry, um, yelling to each other. There were cops running around banging on doors. With all of this going on around her, Rose went inside to check on her own place. And I came out to a cop banging on my door and a neighbor saying, you need to get out of the neighborhood right now. And he basically pushed me into my vehicle and told me to get out and make sure that I was safe. No one was injured and property damage was not nearly as bad as it could have been, thanks to the quick work of firefighters in the air and on the ground. This home needed a new patio and a new roof. Rose's home was spared, but the ordeal has left a scar. We have video footage from our security doorbell and every time I watched it, I just get chills. It's very upsetting. 
Because even though we didn't have any property damage, it was still extremely scary to know that you might lose everything or that if it was in the middle of the night, who could have gotten hurt? On the ground, there's still plenty of evidence of what happened here last July, but from the air, it's clear the green forest is coming back. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, some sad news tonight. Bob Johnston has died. For the past two years, the former chief of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary battled an aggressive, incurable form of brain cancer. And yesterday, that fight ended. Here's a look back at his life and career. Acceptable. It's not going to be tolerated, and we're going to put the resources that are required to bring those people to justice. For many people, Bob Johnston had the qualities of a quintessential good cop. Even in his early days, he had an air of authority and of compassion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about your safety. I don't represent anybody here. We're talking about our jobs. I know, I'm talking about your safety too, sir. His approach, calm and measured, leading with empathy. And today there was uh, somewhat of a domestic dispute. Because we had some dealings with the, the gentleman in the past, uh, the family was concerned, and obviously we were quite concerned to make sure he was okay. And then they started drinking. And I guess with frustration and everything else, and uh, probably in the predicament, and uh, they end up uh, causing damage here. Bob Johnston took on many high-profile investigations and made his mark. We believe uh, that they uh, uh, met foul play. I think somebody out there knows something. He served as a protector and a keeper of justice. I want to make it clear that Gregory Parsons is an innocent victim in this case. The kids are low self-esteem. Uh, and they have very few directions to go in. Operation Razorback has resulted in the seizure of nearly $1 million in illegal drugs. Bob Johnston worked his way up, a steady climb within the ranks until 2010 when he reached the policing pinnacle, chief of the RNC. When there's more disposable income, uh, there's, a, there's a market for illegal business. I worry about this. I worry about the general public because I worry about a stray bullet uh, hitting somebody else. Up. This is uh, an escalation of violence we haven't seen before. If it's in the infancy stages, we've got an opportunity right now to deal with it, and we're going to deal with it. Keep looking over your shoulder because we're going to be relentless until we find you. That determination was rewarded with many honors and medals for exemplary service, including an appointment as an officer of the Order of Merit in 2012. But Chief Johnston lived for more than just the job. He was also a father of two daughters and a husband. In 2014, he retired from a 35-year career with the force to focus on family. It's been an honor to be chief. The RNC owes me nothing. Uh, I owe the RNC everything. Uh, it, uh, it gave me an opportunity to, to help others, and, uh, and that's probably the greatest reward. Three years later came tragic news. The, the exact diagnosis is that I have a glioblastoma, which is stage four cancer, um, and it's inoperable. It was like time stood still, and just being able to breathe was a challenge. And right away, we just, we became wrapped in this blanket of support and love that came around us. He and his wife, Gloria, spoke candidly with CBC about his battle with cancer. It was his way of continuing to help others. If we can give somebody hope and believe that never give up, if one person can survive or one person can live longer, doesn't mean that you can't either. And he did defy the odds by holding on to life longer than the eight to 10 months doctors had predicted. Bob Johnston survived for two years after the diagnosis and vowed not to waste a day in despair. I realize how blessed I am uh, to be where I am and being married to this lovely lady here. She's my soulmate. He was just always so thankful and, and so many times would say to me, we're so blessed. And out of all of this, he still looks at me and says, we're so blessed. So I guess we are blessed. We are. Well, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary wrote a post of condolence for their late chief on social media earlier today. And this afternoon, current RNC chief Joe Boland spoke with reporters. He says Johnston will always be remembered as an important part of the force's history. Just a, a decent human being, a good person, a person that uh, wanted to make a difference in this community and had significant impact on the community, on our officers, 
anybody that met with him that, uh, you know, he had a saying, Bob did, you know, it, people won't remember sometimes what you said or what you did, but they will always remember how you felt when you left them. And that was Bob Johnson in a nutshell. He always made you feel better any time that you had a conversation with him and you walked away. To the United States now, a colorful and popular figure in American politics has died. Texas billionaire Ross Perot. Perot ran twice for U.S. president as an independent, and his brand of frank talk and folksy wisdom was a sharp contrast to his Democratic and Republican opponents. And although he never came close to winning either of the elections that he ran in, in 1992, he did manage to get 19 percent of the presidential vote, more than any other independent candidate. Perot made his fortune in the early days of high tech. And his family says that he had leukemia. Ross Perot was 89. Well, back in this province, a group that helps people with disabilities is in a scramble after a plumbing problem at their building has forced them out. Easter Seals Newfoundland Labrador says keeping their programs and services running while they're homeless is their biggest priority and challenge right now. Here are now Cease Hair reports. The water damage at the Easter Seals Newfoundland and Labrador's nine-year-old building on Mount Sio Road is extensive and means the summer is now a write-off at this location. started here in the bathroom and made its way throughout most of the building. Um, so right now we're in the process of cleaning up, uh, drying things out and uh, estimating how much damage there actually was. In the gymnasium, wet gyp rock has already been hauled away. The gym floor got a good soaking too. Replacing it is a concern because it's not your typical gym floor. We're waiting to see the extent of the damage for the floors. Um, they're special, they're not regular hardwood floors that a regular gym would have. Um, they're special floors that make it uh, easier for wheelchairs to be on. Dehumidifiers now work overtime, extracting moisture from the air. Fans are on bust. The music room and some of its instruments couldn't escape the water's wrath either. The gear is now off site and may have to be replaced. They finally got some good news this afternoon. They have a new location to hold their six week summer camp that had to be canceled this week. It's now moving to McDonald Drive Junior High and starts on Monday. But the what next is still a big problem. They still need to house temporarily 14 office staff to keep the operation going. And they need a boardroom every Wednesday for a program that helps clients overcome barriers to employment. Um, we have campers and Horizons participants and staff members who all need um, accessible washrooms and accessible access to the building. Um, so that's our number one focus right now is, is finding somewhere that uh, is fully or at least mostly accessible. And how tricky will that be? <laughs> it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> and to add insult to this injury, they're also losing money because of this, losing rental revenue for things like weddings. Easter Seals NL says it's way too early to even try to protect the value of the damage, but they do know one thing for sure, that they'll be out of service at this location for at least two months. It could be three. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. There's three different swimming holes that we put down here, and um, this is the third time now that it's been ripped off the pole. Signs warning swimmers of dangerous spots are being torn down, and that has the mayor of Flat Rock worried. That story after Ashley's weather.
great day here in St. John's. Beautiful weekend Gorgeous. and uh, lots of whales off St. John's uh, on Saturday. Yes, Peter Emberley posted a video of that on Facebook. Yeah. Look. I have never seen that many whales before. Oh, look in there, look. Oh, must be a dozen in there. How many, how many spouts that's, are there? That's exactly what I saw. So when I was cod fishing off the boat, we could see them far off in the distance, oh, yeah. and it was just constant. So that's what, it was crazy. Yeah. Four in a row. Four in a row. I suspect yeah. it's going to be bleeped out again any moment now. Yes, it is. It was amazing. I could get, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Call that one. And look out there, look. Yeah, it was incredible. What do you got, man? It's fantastic. Oh, there's fur around here. Oh, yeah. There must be a hundred here, but look, tree here right here. There's another one coming. Right there. He doesn't even know where to point the Whoa. camera. Look at that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a butter and a calf, look. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Didn't even know where to. Holy Jesus. <laughs> okay, we missed a bleeper Oops. there. Yeah. That, uh, that person will be dealt with right after here now tonight. Uh, wow. It's Great. He didn't know where to actually focus. There were so it's many. It's like right? everywhere you turn, there yeah, are whales. There were so many whales. Oh goodness. Beautiful. Yeah. I guess it's a sign that the Cape Lynn are out there. There are fish I hope out so. there. Yeah, must be. Must be. So you managed to catch some of this yourself, right? I did, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. good for you. So good. Got yeah, a lot. You, how many pounds lot. We got, did you get? Well, in total, like the we as a boat, we got we got our 15, which was mm -hmm. really nice. Uh, I don't know how many pounds it was, mm -hmm. but it was a lot. I thought you were talking <laughs> about the whale. Like, how oh, did they no. figure that out? <laughs> So the no, cod fishing cod. was successful? Cod, very mm -hmm. successful. And delicious. She cooked it up and I got to sample some. And I made cod tacos last night too. Yep. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. You must have left a message on my phone <laughs> or something. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm glad you had success. That was your first time out, right? It was, oh, yeah. Good. First good cod, right? Good yep. But uh, not my last, that's for sure. Right. <laughs> Especially if the weather uh, stays the way that it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful day today. Take a look at those temperatures. 24 degrees in St. John's. Uh, it was actually 25 degrees. It got didn't get captured uh, in the um, at the airport, but yeah, 25 degrees, beautiful afternoon. Those temperatures in the 20s as you head towards central as well. Now some rain and thunderstorms have moved through and that with that we saw a drop in temperatures. So down to the teens for Gander, Bonavista, Twilling Gate sitting around 11 degrees as well. And uh, here's a look at that low spinning. So uh, center of the low is up through Labrador and it's been stalled there for the past couple of days. And we are just seeing uh, some of that uh, cloud cover move through. And again, with that, that uh, thunderstorm activity as well, and that has been going on for most of the afternoon. And we're going to continue to see or the potential to see some thunderstorms as we head through the night tonight, at least for the next hour or so as this uh, moves off. And then once we lose that daytime heating, it'll all move off. So Avalon, nice day, a little bit of cloud cover moved through earlier this afternoon. But as we head through the night tonight, uh, it should stay dry. South Coast should stay dry as well. But we are looking at that potential for some showers for the Northern Peninsula, as well as uh, central overnight and then going to stay cloudy with that potential for showers up through Labrador as well. And as this air moves a little bit further south, we're going to see some cooler temperatures. So overnight lows tonight, not too bad. 12 degrees in St. John's, some west southwesterlies, a little bit uh, lighter, 20 or 30 to 50 kilometers per hour overnight tonight. Uh, that potential for showers, as I mentioned, south coast staying dry around 10 degrees. Corner Brook 8 with uh, generally light winds, 5, maybe 10 um, uh, kilometers per hour tonight. Otherwise, seven, six to seven degrees up through Labrador with those northerly winds on shore for the west coast or for uh, coastal Labrador. So tomorrow, uh, that drop in temperature will be moving in, and we're going to see generally cloudy uh, with that potential for showers and rain through the afternoon, mainly for the island. Some clearing skies as we head towards the evening and overnight, and that's because a ridge of high pressure moves in, and with that. We're going to see another warm up. So here's a look at tomorrow's forecast 15, 16 degrees. So uh, about a good five, three to five degrees cooler than what we saw today. Uh, so those winds are going to shift. So northeasterly winds 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. Uh, some fog possible up through Bonavista 13 degrees. And you're going to see that as we head towards central as well. 13, 14 degrees, a little cooler along the northeast coast. And then similar temperatures. Best chance of seeing some sunshine will be down through the south coast. Port of Basque 15, uh, Stephenville 13. And then as we head towards the north. Northern Peninsula again cool uh, with that potential for some fog and drizzle through the day and showers. Lab City beautiful 17 degrees with some sunshine. We can thank that ridge of high pressure 
Again, that's going to warm up as we head towards the next couple of days. But we'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the mayor of Flat Rock is upset that someone has ripped down signs on Big River. The signs warned swimmers about the dangers of the river after a teenager drowned. The mayor shared his frustration and concerns with Here and Now's Peter Cowan. There's not a whole lot you can do with a river, so we said maybe education is the best tool. So we put up some signs and uh, just basically uh, always like these. And it w basically what it would do is, is just telling you what the swimming, where the area is, why it's called that, and just a little bit of information on how dangerous it is after heavy rainfall. So we put these up at, there's three different swimming holes that we put them at down here. And um, this is the third time now that it's been ripped off the pole. Listen, if you're going to do this, understand that after a heavy rainfall, these rivers are treacherous, you know, so know where you're jumping in, you know, be careful. So, I mean, you do need some common sense, I guess, to, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with this area, don't, don't just come down and just jump, jump aboard this river. You know, they, have, a, have a look, walk into it first. And that's, that's kind of, it's just information we wanted to put out there, hopefully to save someone from getting hurt badly or even dying again. Just a bit of history, and then there's a little bit of information, like, you know, the strong currents are even stronger after a day of heavy rain. Right, the, the rain runoff usually takes a day or so to get into the river, uh, causing the river to flow savagely. And then it's just, it's, I mean, these are not designated swim areas. I know people love to swim here and that's fine, you know, but as from a town's perspective, we haven't designated these as swim areas. And I don't know if that offends people, but maybe, and maybe it does, you know. So, and if that's the case, well, it's, that wasn't our intention. You know, we got a lot of really good response when we put the signs up saying, you know, it was nice for her to have that information out there. Um, I'm hoping that it has made, made some changes and made some difference down here. And, you know, like I said, when we put these signs up, I said, if we could save one life, they're worth it, you know? So, uh, so that, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll probably put them up again, you know, and we'll, we might make them out of a heavier material this next time. And just hopefully they'll stay up. And, and I just want, if, if they offend somebody, just, Give me a call. They come to the town office, and, and they'll get in contact with me, and we can have a chat. And I can change. We can change them if there's a if they're offensive to anybody. It just doesn't make sense from an economic point of view to have all of these different uh, towns and communities incorporated with their own interpretation, and all of it costing every single one of us. Larry Short weighs in on the cost of town managers and the question of amalgamation for the Metro St. John's region.
Earlier on here now, Katie Breen brought you the uncomfortable truth about how much it costs to have so many city managers and town managers in our region. For more on this, I'm joined now by Larry Short, Chartered Professional Accountant, who talks about these kinds of matters with us. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. So, listen, Larry, one of the things that we raised in this reporting has to do with it costs more than a million dollars in salaries for to have so many town managers, but this goes beyond salaries. What's the problem with the amount of municipal bloat that we have? Uh, the difficulty is when a business is looking to locate in the local area and they want to do a project. Take, take something as simple as somebody wants to do a housing development in three or four towns. They have to deal with three or four separate planning departments. And although all of the planning departments may be adhering to the same guidelines, the same uh, requirements, they have different interpretations. So there's multiple submissions, there's multiple forms, there's multiple dealings and delays. And I've had clients who over the years have been supremely frustrated because they had something resolved with uh, the city of St. John's and then they had to turn around and do the exact same application to the city of Mount Pearl, who has a completely different uh, idea of how this should, this project should be uh, right. done. The city of Mount Pearl, not too far that a ways. 12 kilometers from where we're standing, and that is again highlighting the ridiculousness of uh, the, you know, the way that, that we can understand how it evolved, that it was all very much, you know, different separate towns and communities, but we've grown together. So it just doesn't make sense from an economic point of view to have all of these different uh, towns and communities incorporated with their own interpretation, and all of it costing every single one of us. The fact is, Larry, you're kind of raising the A word, amalgamation without actually seeing it. Everybody loves their town and municipality. Nobody wants to do this. Yeah, we had to be very careful. I thought amalgamation meant the joining of towns and cities, but actually what it means is that there's a governing body above the towns and cities. And that is actually adding to cost. So this is an actual merger of the various towns and cities together into one uh, one jurisdiction that can govern uh, this. Right. And again, you have to, to realize that we're competing against the rest of Canada when it comes to trying to keep our our children within this province and to be able to grow and prosper here. So we need every single edge we, that we can get. We need to reduce those costs as much as possible in order to cut the out migration. All right. This is not going to change though unless the provincial government decides to do something. No municipality is going to say, right. hey, we're going to vote ourselves out of existence. Right. So here's a great case of calling for leadership of the provincial government to say this may be unpopular in certain sectors. I mean, I can see the people in Mount Pearl with the pitchforks ready to march on the city hall, but the fact of the matter is that it should be done. Right. CBS Paradise would not be far behind. Larry Short, appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Pleasure. Interesting topic. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a sprawling greenhouse at Pat's Plants and Gardens in Bay Bulls. It's full of 300 carefully designed hanging baskets with names like Fisherman's Blues and With Jake's Heart. There are 18 different designs, each with carefully selected blooms and each representing a person who took their own life or somebody who's still struggling with mental health difficulties. Now, the baskets are going to be sold this Saturday. It's a fundraiser for the Jacob Puttister Foundation. Uh, my brother Jake um, was amazing. He was the light of every room. He was enthusiastic. He was funny. He was kind. Um, and he also struggled with mental illness for um, five years until he lost his battle on August 24th, 2016 um, at the age of 21. Yeah. This is our third year doing Baskets of Hope. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to reach out to the community and to the Southern Shore and to everybody, really because there is a lot of mental health issues around. I got this idea that we would create a basket and with the basket people would come in and they'd, they would sit with me and talk about what it is that they wanted the basket to represent and, and what's their loved one's favorite colors, that, what was their favorite colors so that we could put it all together. And then they would give it a name and it was a personal name. It's not a name that I gave it or, you know, or pet. It was from them because that name for that basket meant something to them. The first I heard of it, we'll say, um, was just a couple months after Jake died, Peggy messaged me on Facebook. So when Peggy first mentioned the actual idea of Baskets of Hope, of this, this event where we would get to create a basket in memory of our loved ones and we would sell them and the proceeds would come to the foundation, I was amazed. I was blown away. So we, we went back and forth and finally we came up with the name Baskets of Hope. And from there it just took off. Uh, so the foundation has raised over $200,000 in the last couple of years through events such as Baskets of Hope and our other events, Shifting Gears. 
Um, we have provided um, counseling scholarships to youth so that they can gain access to counseling services quicker so that there's no wait list. Um, we've also donated money to organizations such as Thrive, Choices for Youth. I hope that people who show up on Saturday take away a sense of community and a sense that they're not alone, that we're in it together. Um, if, if it's someone who's lost someone here, I hope that they know that, that we love and support them, um, that we care about them, that we see their struggle in the aftermath of a death by suicide because that is, um, that is so difficult. Um, and that we're not forgetting them, you know, and we're not ashamed to speak their name and to say, tell about them and say their story, because I think that's, that can be really important in the healing process. Beautiful baskets and the people you saw there, Pat Puddister, Peggy Head and Kelsey Puddister. Baskets of Hope takes place at Pat's Plants and Gardens on Saturday. And if you're not too sure where that is, it's on the main road in Bay Bowls and it runs from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So he doesn't mind people. He doesn't, no. He's kind of a ham. Kind of a ham. Looks like a moose. Strong bonds <laughs> at the Salmonier Nature Park. <laughs> we take you inside the wildlife refuge to meet the animals and the humans who care for them. Welcome back. Last week we brought you to Salmonier Nature Park, the wildlife haven that has been rehabilitating animals since the 1970s. Mm, and some of the animals have spent their entire lives there living in the park since the mid 90s. And because of that, as you can imagine, the people who care for those animals, well, they've created quite the bond. Joey, Joey, come on, Joey, come on. A lot of folks come to Newfoundland Labrador just to see moose, right? They want to have a look at moose or caribou. And of course, having an animal like, like this one here at the park is a real attractor for us, you know. He was 18 months old when I got to meet him. He loves people. They're on a pelleted feed made especially for moose. Um, we also give them browse every day. We go out and cut branches of like birch or willow or whatever and uh, bring it in. We fill the back of the truck up and bring it in every day and give it to them. So he doesn't mind people? He doesn't, no. He's kind of a ham. <laughs> You're on TV, look! You love that! Come on, Joey! No, it needs a drink. <laughs> mm. 
do. Yum, yum, yum. Michelle, I have a feeling you love your job. <laughs> it's my dream job, yes. Mm -hmm. Depending where she is, she likes to hide under the boardwalk, so sometimes we have to come in and actually search for her. <laughs> and then she just flies out and waits. And we just try and toss it as close to her as possible. Because a lot of times there's ravens around and they're watching, and they, they sometimes they'll come in and take it from her. See how good my arm is today. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Oh my God, get out of there. Yeah, you know, he's feeding himself. It's like candy, caribou candy. <laughs> he's like an addict. He loves to like him more than anybody. Hey, Pepper. She's pretty used to us being in here, but she won't let us go any closer. So this is her daily mouse? Yeah, and we like to hide it somewhere different every day. So I think I'm gonna put it up in this tree. She gets really mad if she can't find it right away. She'll start to growl. Getting it? Yay! <laughs> Off lunch now. <laughs> Cute. Seventy Nature Park, popular yeah. with everybody except for the rodents, as <laughs> oh, you may have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. It is a I great place. Haven't been there in years. I'd yeah. love to go out and see yeah. what it's like out there now. Especially the summer. If you've never been out there, you should check it out. It's fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Well, turning now to a sad animal story in British Columbia, where another gray whale has been found dead. This nearly 10 meter whale washed up on the shores of Haida Gwaii. It is now the eighth gray whale to be found dead in BC this year. A necropsy has been completed, but there is no obvious cause of death. Gray whales migrate north along the coast in the summers. Dozens have washed up in the US. Officials there say they appeared undernourished. More troubling whale stories on our side of Canada. An international rescue operation is underway today in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Three more North Atlantic right whales are stuck, entangled in fishing gear. And there are only about 400 of these creatures left in the world. The government has imposed new speed restrictions, but the dangerous job of trying to rescue these whales, well, that falls to a group of volunteers. Gabrielle Fami has that story. Finding a whale in the ocean is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Freeing the 50-ton animal in distress is a whole other story. These whales are trying to avoid you. They're stressed out, so it's really tough to, uh, to get up close enough to work on them. Fisheries and Oceans and Transport Canada are both flying planes over the Gulf. The Coast Guard is sending in a vessel. American officials are in Shippigan, too. They'll start at the whale's last known location and split up to cover as much water as possible. But despite this being a major government operation, the ones doing the dangerous work of getting close to the giant mammals are volunteers like Green. These kinds of operations were suspended after Joe Howlett's death two years ago. The fisherman and volunteer whale rescuer was crushed by the weight of a right whale's tail seconds after he'd freed it. And this is the first major right whale rescue since. I think of Joe every day. We were great friends and we always said if something happened, we were going to keep it going. Howlett died trying to save an endangered species the federal government is responsible for protecting, doing work only a handful are willing to do. And much like two years ago, the death rate of 2019 is alarming. Six whales killed so far, three after they were struck by ships. One of these tangled whales has been stuck in U.S. fishing gear since April. It's not clear what happened to the other two. The rescue mission could last as long as a week. Gabrielle Fami, CBC News, Moncton. Doing something a little different tonight. Want to know where you think this picture is taken? Where are you two? Uh, Apparently in the middle of a body of water. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eastport? <laughs> I'll tell you where this photo was taken when we come back.
Lots of great conditions for some beautiful photos of late. Mm. Yes, yeah. we had uh, this was on the weekend. We'll take a look at that uh, viewer photo of the day. You guessed, but you were wrong. It's actually in Spread Eagle. Ah. ah. Yeah. Lovely photo there. I really uh, enjoyed the fact that you're kayaking. That's exactly yeah. what I want to do. <laughs> so, Great spot. Yes. Thank you so much for Wayne uh, for sending that in. And if you want to send us any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. And, uh, you know, hopefully those temperatures over the next couple of days won't be too bad. So here's what... Uh, Here's what we're seeing as far as uh, the current temperatures go across the island. We can see that cooler air up through Labrador, only 12 degrees in Lab City, 20 in St. John's. That's the hot spot. But as we head through the next couple of days, we're going to see that cold pool of air shift a little bit further south. And then into the weekend, we're going to get back into that ridge of high pressure or ridging in the jet stream, which is going to warm things up in time for the weekend. So if we can get through this next couple of days, it does look like we're in for a warm up. So that low pressure system is still going to affect us though into Thursday. Uh, at least the first half of Thursday, we'll see some cloud cover and some onshore flow as well. Uh, some clearing skies up through Labrador though, so it looks like a nice afternoon. But uh, again, those temperatures are going to stay cool. The next weather maker will move in for uh, Friday. So here's your temperatures. Uh, maybe reaching 9 degrees for Gander is your afternoon high. 11 in St. John's. A little bit warmer for Corner Brook at 16, but uh, that warm air is up through uh, Labrador as we head through Thursday. So 23 degrees for Lab City, 20 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. But as I mentioned, those temperatures are going to warm up as we head through the next few days. So here's a look at uh, what we're expecting over the next five days for St. John's in Eastern Newfoundland, 16 degrees on uh, tomorrow with that chance of showers. Again, you're going to stay cool into Thursday. And then Friday will start to recover. It looks like we should hit the 20 degree range by the time Saturday and Sunday rolls around 21 degrees should be the afternoon high there. And then uh, for central Newfoundland, 14 degrees tomorrow, 12 on Thursday. And then we'll uh, see some sunshine, it looks like, for Friday. And that's when those temperatures will really bump up. 23 for you and then Saturday and Sunday. Look at that temperature, 27 degrees. It does look like we'll get back into some of that humidity as well, as of now anyway, with that potential for some showers. Now for western Newfoundland, 13 degrees tomorrow, 16 by Thursday with some sunshine. Then going to stay nice into Friday. It looks like 22 degrees. And then stay within that range as we head towards Sunday. But it does look wet as of now for the weekend. For eastern Labrador, 13 degrees, 20 on Thursday. Uh, Thursday and then Friday you're going to bump up again and then for Saturday and Sunday again thanks to that low pressure system we'll see a little bit uh, a little bit of rainy weather and then for Western Labrador same thing 17 tomorrow and then back into that 20 degree range by the time Thursday rolls around your overnight lows still in the teens and then for the weekend Saturday and Sunday looking at that rain and temperatures in the teens so that's a look at your forecast for the next couple of days. Thanks, Ashley. Now for a look at national news. Dozens of people were transported to hospitals in Winnipeg this morning following a dangerous carbon monoxide leak at a hotel on the city's western edge. I can't remember a situation this big anywhere in Canada where it's been carbon monoxide, where we've had a whole hotel, uh, where we've had to dress up, where we had to go room to room and literally bring people out and take them to the hospital. The call came in shortly after 10 o'clock when an alarm went off in the hotel's boiler room and people reported difficulty breathing. 46 of the 52 guests and staff on site were taken to hospital. 15 are in critical condition. Symptoms of dizziness, headache and confusion become noticeable after 70 parts per million. Readings at the hotel measured up to 385. The cause of the elevated levels is not yet known. Carbon monoxide poisoning can damage the heart and cause permanent brain damage. Canada's premiers are meeting in Saskatchewan's Big River First Nation. The gathering includes some Indigenous leaders and Quebec's premier says their participation is important that it's a kind of three ways uh, negotiation uh, between the federal government, province and uh, the First Nations. So it's never easy, but we know we have to make improvement, improvements regarding uh, services. Now this year's meeting marks the first time since 2016 that Assembly of First Nations Chief Perry Bellegarde is meeting with the Premiers. Last year, several Indigenous organizations chose not to attend. They've expressed frustration in the past that they are only invited to discuss Indigenous issues and not the wider political agenda. 
The Métis National Council is continuing its boycott, and Inuit leaders are also absent. Welcome back. Well, the feathered dancing queen you're about to see is definitely no bird brain. <laughs> yeah, Snowball is one rockin' cockatoo. He's been showing off his moves for years, only to music he likes, of course. Yeah, and his rhythm has even impressed scientists. A team from Harvard, yes, Harvard, really? studied Snowball. <laughs> And they verified that this energetic cockatoo has, in fact, invented 14 <laughs> rare and original moves previously unseen in Birdland, including rolling his claws, flapping his wings, and shaking his booty <laughs> to the music. Yeah. Adorable. Semicircle. Hi. <laughs> there are a lot of animals uh, yeah. on uh, the show tonight. Yes, we have. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. There we go. Awesome. So we'll do just a quick recap of uh, tomorrow's forecast. Just quickly, uh, if you take a look at that, temperatures are going to cool down significantly, about three to five degrees cooler. Best chance of seeing that sunshine will be down through the southwest. But uh, definitely get an umbrella tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right. There we yeah. go. Wednesday <laughs> is upon us already. Mm -hmm. And uh, have a great night. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night.